I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning. Since we're here today, uh, we're just here for the first time in a long time. I want to talk to you about knowing God. But I'm going to do this as we journey through the book of Exodus, right? Now, as a church, we just got done reading Colossians. Hopefully, you guys are on that Bible reading plan, right? Even if you're not participating in a group, you're still reading your Bible. But as an individual, I've been through the book of Exodus, and I'm literally going to talk to you about all these four steps using the book of Exodus, okay? So we're going to be in Exodus chapter 3, and I want to talk to you about church being essential. I want to talk to you about church being necessary. Now, before 2019, they did a survey, and they said people used to go to church about once every three or four Sundays, once every three or four Sundays. That was a normal church attendance. In the middle of 2021, when people were coming back to church, okay, in the middle of when people were coming back to church, they did a, another survey, and they said people are going somewhere between once every four and once every six weeks. Church attendance had declined so rapidly. It was the first time in America's statistical facts that more people did not go to church than went to church. I mean, it was completely crazy. And why is that? Because people got into the habit of thinking church was optional and not essential. Church was just when it was convenient and not that it was something to be relied upon. And so I want to get back to that. I want to talk to you about the benefits of going to church, okay? In order to do that, let's start with our opening text in the book of Exodus chapter 3, verse 18. It says this, then the elders of Israel, put a pause right there, recap real quickly, Exodus 1, we read about how Joseph died. Pharaoh comes into power. He's really mad that the children of Israel have multiplied, and he puts out a decree to kill every male-born child. That's called infanticide. It's when you want to kill babies. It's called infanticide. So we're going to kill them all. And the midwives said, no, we won't get rid of the male children. And, they, and all of a sudden, Moses was born. The Bible says he's no ordinary child. That's, that's Exodus 1. Exodus 2, Moses is raised into a grown man. He gets into a little bit of a dilemma. He gets banished because he kills a fellow uh, Egyptian. He gets banished. We see Moses has his burning bush experience. Exodus 3, God has sent Moses back. And the first thing was, you need to go talk to the elders of Israel. And here's what it says. They will accept this message. Then you and the elders must go to the king of Egypt and tell him this. The Lord God, this is the very first time he's talked to him, the God of the Hebrews has met with us, so please let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. In other words, he said, let me take him to church. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the reading of your word. It is my prayer that as you speak to me, speak through me for the blessing and the benefit of your people. In Jesus' name we say, Amen. God has always desired that we have a place to worship. God has always desired to be worshiped. Now, what you may not know is God has, has desired to be worshipped, but we as human beings love to worship things. We love to gather together, and whether it's cheering on our favorite football team, cheer on our favorite baseball team, or just go to a concert where we can all sing along, we were created to be together and to glorify something. This is what you would call your affections. That's why people like going to car shows. They like to all go see the nice cars, and you like to hang out with people who also appreciate nice cars. That's why some people like to go antique shopping. Not me, but some people, right? So let me show you a picture of where people have gone to worship before. You should bring that picture up right there. Look at that picture. Yeah. Isn't she purdy? Some of you aren't clapping. Some of you aren't clapping. Some of you are looking at me like, that place is the pit of hell right there. That's how I'm getting up into heaven right there in the Death Star. Take me home, Lord, right there. That's right. That's where your team will go to die. You know, I'm just messing with you. Uh, kind of. I see the Raiders shirt, that's what I'm talking about, bro, right there, there. I'm going to get a picture right there, right? I'm going to preach a sermon from right there. Okay, so we see, oh, here's another stadium. Here, here, let's do the next one, let's do the next one. Yeah, there you go. Where are my Dodger fans at? There you go, yeah. I can tell who the Giants fans are because you all mad about that sweep two weeks ago. Yeah, you all still salty about it. Well, we didn't play good. Obviously, you didn't play good. This is why you got swept. Bring out the brooms, right? So, I like how everybody takes that so personal. Like you know somebody or like you were playing that day. Oh, that hurt. <laughs> People like to get together, right? People like to get together. They like to gather around. They like to do these things. Does this make sense? Because we're created to worship, right? Now, what I want to talk to you about, and you can, and you can, you can take a picture of this if you want to, is I put this. The strength of the local church is in its creative ability to gather together for the benefit of the believer, See, when we, put, when, we, when we get up here and we do worship, we, we play worship and we sing worship, it's not really for the non-believer because I don't know if you, I, I, I've been a non-believer. I remember walking into church. I'm like, I don't know any of these songs, right? So it's not for the non-believer because sometimes you walk into church and you're like, I don't know what that song is. Like, I don't even know where to start, where it ends. Like, am I off key? You know, does that make sense? So we don't know these things. It's not for the, when we do worship, it's for you, the believer, 
you already have a personal walk with Jesus. And, and even the new songs we, we introduce, why? Because these songs have, here it is, meaning. Right? When we talk about promises, it has a meaning. We talk about a fresh wind, it has a meaning. Does this make sense? So it's for the believer. And when we get up and we preach the word, this is, a, this is a word, an inspiration for all. So you could be a believer or a pre-believer, right? And you're going to get something from this message, right? Because we're going to have personal application. So this is very important that we understand that there's a creativeness to our services. And we design these services with all walks of life of people in mind. That's why, that's why we did the snack table. That's why back in the day, um, we, we've done everything that we've done is why. So that we can let guards down. Because if you let a guard down, you're able to minister to the heart. And so that's why we do what we do, but that's the strength of the local church. Now, it's, th this part is simple. We need to get back to a place where we make church a priority. Yeah. And there's a reason for this because we got to be real careful of being cultural Christians. You know, we're just a Christian when it's convenient. We're a Christian that has no conviction. And so we're only a Christian when it suits us. God doesn't want you to be a cultural Christian. He wants you to be a disciple, a believer, who's all in on what he's asking you to do. If that's the case, then church has to move up the priority list. It's like this. First Wednesday, we're having Pastor Mark come here. Pastor Mark is a personal pastor and mentor to me. He's been walking me through this whole journey. Um, I don't know why he likes me. This guy isn't just Pastor... <laughs> I really don't. He's not just pastor of one church. I believe he's got 10 campuses just where he lives. And he's a pastor, global pastor, because he's got like a thousand campuses outside of the U.S. He has a Bible college. He's very busy. I mean, this guy is literally, if you Google him, you'll see how big he really is. Why he likes me, I don't know. All I know is I showed up to an event one time. I, 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 I signed it off as everybody's going to have at least one Mexican friend. That's all I can think of because that's who I was. <laughs> I just walked in. I was like, hey, orale. <laughs> que onda? <laughs> I was like, they must not have no Mexicans in Portland because he just took a liking to me, right? And we hit it off. Now, I think it helps we met at a snack table. It was a dessert table. And him and I just kept going at it. <laughs> and the rest is history. But he doesn't have to take time out of his busy schedule to come here. He's coming here because he believes in what we're doing here. He is an apostolic voice into our current situation. Why am I saying all this? So make First Wednesday a priority. You make it a priority because, listen, if you don't schedule it in, something else will schedule itself in. So we have to make that a priority. So let's, look, look at this. Look at this. Let's go all the way to Exodus 25. It's going to come up on the board. I want to show you something. It says, the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. Now, real quickly, um, if you've been in church a long time, and if you haven't been in church a long time, I'm trying to make this easy. So in the Bible, it talks about several different types of offerings, right? And if you were a Jew, then you would understand there's like several layers to those offerings. There's a free will offering. There's a grain offering. There's a first fruit offering. There's an offering for your offering. And this specific one, I want, I want you to see where they call this a free will in other words, there's no prompting. Sometimes you'll go and be in a church service. Somebody will get up and say, hey, there's a, there's a hundred people in here right now who can all give a thousand dollars. Where are you at? Right? There's a hundred people. And there's 10,000 people who can give $20. And where are you at? Right? They do stuff like that. I want you to see this right here. God is literally saying, I'm going to ask you to pray about it, to see what I prompt you. I'll, I'll prove it to you. He goes this, you are to receive the offering for me. Remember, we, we give to God through the church. Does that make sense? Because how do you really give to God because he's not in front of you? You do it through the church. Look what he says. You're going to get this offering and you're going to give it through. You're going to give it to me through what I'm going to tell you to do. So it's always through a conduit of blessing. For everyone whose heart prompts them to give. There's no fleecing there. It's you close your eyes. You ask God to tell you. You respond. Make sense? Now watch this. I'm going to show you why it's you respond. Look at the list of things. Watch this. This is crazy. These are the offerings you are to receive. Gold, silver, and bronze. Blue and purple, scarlet yarn of fine linen, goat hair. I've been in church a long time. No pastor has ever gotten up and asked for some goat hair. Next week, I'm going to do it. I'm going to be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Today we're going to pass the offering to bucket around. Can you all put some goat hair in? Okay. <laughs> Ram skin, dyed red, another type of durable leather, acacia wood, olive oil for the light spices, for the anointing oil, and the fragrant incense. Onyx stones and other gems to be mounted on the ephod of the breastplates. This is for the priest. Here it is. Then have them make a sanctuary for me 
and I will dwell amongst them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishing exactly like the pattern I'll show you. God said, build me a house. A place of worship. This is our command. This is what he's asking us to do. It's important that we have a place to gather. Now, now here's what's crazy. If you go back to those stadiums, it doesn't, matter, it doesn't matter if you win or lose. You're just excited to be there. I remember the first time going to the Oakland Coliseum. It was a bad day because we lost, but I remember going. I remember going. Some of you just took joy in the fact that we lost. Because I saw the grin like, you guys always lose, right? <laughs> Still funny. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> so I remember going, and, and I remember even though we lost, right, I was still happy I went. It was about the experience, right? And I, I just want to go a step further. What you invest in, you start to create an expectation from. Let's go over here. What you invest in, you start to create an expectation from. So like, 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 like right now, my, my dad called me, my dad called me, um, whatever, a couple weeks ago, I can't remember, whatever. And he said, hey, I almost had tickets to the game. I'm like, all right, dad, because he was supposed to come out, in, well, he's still coming out in September, but he's like, yeah, I, I was going for luxury box seats, but I got outbid. I'm like, well, well, I'm, well what was the budget? He goes, oh, man, it was at least five grand. For a game? I'm like, well, yeah, because we're going to sit in comfort. I'm like, let's go. <laughs> Comfort, my middle name, Anthony Comfort Flores. You know what I mean? And he goes, no. He goes, no, knucklehead, we lost. I'm like, oh, okay. Oh, all right, we lost. I mean, I don't remember putting anything in, but we lost. Darn it. Golly gee, right? He goes, yeah, they went for seven grand. I'm like, whoa. He said, Watch this. I said, well, what do you, well, well, what the heck do you get for seven grand? He goes, anything and everything. He goes, if you're going to put that much in, you're going to expect that much out. He goes, you have your own concierge, Everything, every, everything's open to you, you ain't got to go nowhere, you got a personal TV. I'm like, oh, okay. See, because what you start spending your money on, you start expecting something back in return. That's why you get mad when your car breaks down. Even though you didn't change the oil or put spark plugs or anything else, you're still mad because you paid for it one time. You expect, <laughs> now I'm picking on you, okay. So we expect, we expect, <laughs> that was funny. I ain't preached three services in a long time, so I'm, I'm losing it. Okay, so here's the deal. I want to talk to you about gathering in large groups and in small groups. This is the biblical definition. So when we think about a large group, that's a Sunday. Now think about it. Think about, I'm not talking about your, your fancy eye watch. I'm talking about the old school watches that actually had like, had like gears in them, okay? Do you guys remember what that is? It's like a large thing, okay? So Sunday service is a large gear that turns all the smaller gears, right? So that we can do certain things. So everything starts here. It's like right now. Baptisms are tonight. If you are thinking about getting baptized, stop thinking about it and just show up and we will dunk you. Okay? Now, but I, I'm scared. Bring your rubber ducky, your favorite towel. We got you. I got you. We're gonna, this is gonna be this is gonna be great. God is gonna do something. Don't hesitate. Take a next step, right? So this is a large gear in which we launch small groups. We got a men's breakfast next Saturday. Men, just show up. We already know you're not gonna sign up, so just show up. We'll have the food. <laughs> That's funny. That's true. But we're going to have enough food. Don't worry about it. Just show up, right? That's a large gear turning a small gear. Now watch this. Acts 2.42 is going to come up on the board through 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe. Many signs and wonders were performed at the apostles, by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, large group gathering. Look at the next verse. They broke bread in their homes and then they ate together. Large group gathering, small group gathering, right? They were with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now, I know there's a movement going on right now that says you don't need to meet in a large church gathering. You could just meet in homes. What I simply, what I simply ask is this. Why would God put it in here if he didn't expect you to live it out there? I don't understand that. So to which I say you're supposed to do both. This is a shameless plug to let you know that small groups are happening here real soon. We're gonna, you're going to be seeing all these brochures and all these pictures of people. And we want you to get plugged into a small group. You have your large group gathering, which you guys obviously look around. Plus they're next door. Plus they're watching online. Obviously you guys get the hint. You guys like to be here. But now we got to go from a large group gathering. You got to go to a small group gathering. Why? So that you can grow. And let me, let me explain to you why. 
Okay, this, this, I'm, hopefully I break this all down correctly. I wrote this down. A personal revelation. So when I read my Bible, I get a personal revelation. And I submit it to you guys for community application. I'm going to give you two points in here in a minute for you to walk out and do as soon as you leave this place, okay? Homework. All right. So I get a personal revelation for community application, right? Right here. If we apply it, it equals transformation first for you, then your home, and then the people who live closest to you. Do you see that? Do you see that? So I have, I, I have two Bible reading uh, plans. I got the one that we do as a church, which I encourage every single one of you to do. You just got to get the app. You can hit what's the, what's the Bible chapter for the day, right? So we just got out of Colossians, right? And so we do the Bible app. I have a group that I belong to. So I have my staff, which I give the four questions. We don't got time for that, but I give the four questions. I submit it to them on a group me. And then I have a group of guys that I do this with and I submit it to them. And this is what I tell people. Even if you don't respond, just go ahead and read your chapter for the day and then read what I wrote or read what, read what everybody else wrote as well. Why? Because it's going to be revealed to you. More is caught than taught sometimes. So I'm going to get you in the habit of doing these things. Now watch, let me give you an example. I guarantee you when you first gave your heart to Jesus, you did not know how to pray. And everybody's scared to pray on public. Like, hey, we want you to pray out loud. No, I'm good. I'm good. Like, I'm, mm, God knows my heart. Shoot. How many get nervous when it's pray out loud, huh? Huh? They put you on the spot. How do you think, how do you guys feel? I'm a pastor. They always do it to me. Oh, there's a pastor. Have him pray. Thanks, guys. Hi, I am the pastor. Glad to meet you, right? Nobody starts out, remember the first time I ever prayed in public, I cussed. It slipped, bro. I don't know what to tell you. It's like, but it was, okay. Am I the only one who feels like there's level to cuss words? Some are worse than others. Am, am I the only one? Thank you. Like seven of us. Cause you know, half of y'all cussed on your way to church today. <laughs> some of you are just like, dang it. How did he know? Who told, right? It's true though, huh? Somebody cut you off and you let something fly. That's right. <laughs> okay. My point is some things take practice, right? You didn't just open up the Bible and understand all things. It takes practice. You got to read and reread and read and reread. Okay. So let me, let me explain to you like this. So I'll give you an example. So I'm reading, uh, I'm, I'm my personal time with the Lord. This is just for me, my personal time. I'm reading the book of Exodus. So I'm reading a chapter a day. I try never to miss a day and I'm doing the same four questions. So I'm in Exodus chapter six and I see something I have never seen before. It blows me away. I mean, just, I, I got to share it with you. Exodus chapter six, verse two. And God also said to Moses, now here's where, unless you know a little bit of context of Jewish history, Jewish oral history and, and Talmud and all these things of, of, of Jewish faith, this ain't going to make no sense. So I'm going to break it down for you. He says this, God also says to Moses, I am the Lord. Now I'm not mean unto you because this is poorly translated. If this was in the Tanakh, if this was in the Hebrew, he says, I am Hashem, Yahweh. I am a name. Why? Because if you give something a name, you define it. This is an apple. If you pur puree it, it'll be apple sauce. If you juice it, it'll be apple. If you cut it into wedges, it's still apple slices. But what is it still? Will it ever be an orange? It, it'll be boxed in. as just an apple, no matter what you do to it. God says, today I'm your provider. I'm Yahweh Yaira. Tomorrow I might be your healer, which is Jehovah Rapha. Do you see what I'm saying? In other words, you can't box me in. So watch this progression. He says, first, I am Yahweh. I, the, the Jews would say Hashem, which literally means the name. Because they're not allowed to say God's name. So it's Hashem, right? Now watch this. He goes, I appeared, whoa, this is good. He goes, I appeared to Abraham, I appeared to Isaac, and I appeared to Jacob as God Almighty. Total different name. That right there, God Almighty is El Shaddai. In other words, I am God over everything. I am God that is sovereign. El Shaddai. I am God Almighty. In other words, everybody else bows to me. There's only one name greater than the El Shaddai, and it's El Elohim. In other words, I am the God of everything that's, that exists, will exist, or ever has existed. I am God over that. So he says, listen, I appear to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as just El Shaddai, but I'm appearing to you as Yahweh, and this is what blows me away. Then he goes on like this. He goes, but by my name, says the Lord, Adonai. There's three different names. Three different names. He says, by my name, Adonai, 
which means I'm just your personal Lord. You, Moses, I did not make myself fully known to them. He said there was a whole nother level that they could have went to, but they didn't get to see it. He said, Moses, brace yourself like a man because I'm about to show you sides of me that no one has ever seen if you come up on the mountaintop with me. See, if you want to go somewhere with God, you got to go up. God already went down to get you there so you can go up. You got to go up. You can't go down. This is amazing. This is amazing. So what? So I get personal revelation from reading my Bible with God. I get personal revelation. I submit it to you for community application. And if you walk it out, you get personal transformation, household transformation, and family transformation. If you walk these things out. This is why we come to church. Okay, okay. I got I to get moving. He's going to kick me off the stage here. So, okay, okay. Watch this. So let me give you two things that I feel like we're going to benefit from if we continue to make church priority. Number one is you're going to love better. John 13, 34 to 35, and this is very, like, he puts this all up in your, in your face right here. He goes, I'm giving you a new commandment. This is Jesus talking. Love each other just as I loved you. You should love each other. I, I think he wants you to love each other. <laughs> your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. You know what I feel like God's doing? Did any of you have kids that used to just fight a lot? Anybody have kids that fight a lot? Do you ever just want to put them in the same shirt and say, now you all stuck together? <laughs> yeah, how are we going to go to the bathroom? You'll figure it out. You know, you know what I'm talking about, huh? You know, it's, it's bickering all the time. And you know you used to do that with your siblings, right? Yeah. And nobody ever wants to admit it. Everybody, no, I didn't. No, yeah, you probably worse, okay? <laughs> and I feel like this is what God is saying to us right now. He's watching the love of most grow cold. He's watching God's people fight. Wow. I've never lived in a generation where there was so much cancel. People don't agree with you on everything, so you unfriend them. You unfollow them. You cut them off. For what? I mean, is that what you're going to do to your marriage? Is the second you two disagree? Come on. I mean, let's be honest. Out of the last 30 days, haven't you made decisions that you wish you could come back and undo, but yet you made them? Did you cancel yourself? <laughs> no, you probably rewarded yourself. Hey, dummy, that was stupid, but let's go get ice cream. Okay, yeah, that's all right. <laughs> Skinny jeans I couldn't reach. I was trying to. I was just like... <laughs> that was just like, all right. But does that make sense? That's the point. You can't, you can't do it. You, but we're doing that now. Everything's about let's get rid of them. They don't, they, don't, they don't believe everything we believe. No one's ever going to believe everything you believe. It's not going to happen. you got to work through it. You know what I feel like? I feel like if some of our grandparents were here, they'd slap you. <laughs> and, and you know what? Here's the truth. My grandpa, it, it, my grandpa used to have this stick he brought back from World War II. If mama's watching, she'll, she'll post about it. It's this stick that I, I promised to God I tried to break it on like several occasions. It was like possessed. I mean, I would hide it. It'd show back up. Like one time, I, I was a fat kid, and I, I mean, I was stuck it on a little ledge, and I jumped on it, and I bounced off. Like, I was like, that's impossible. Like, I'm fat. Like, that's not supposed to happen. And then one time, I hit it for my grandpa. The next day, it was there. I was like, oh, my gosh. And so whenever we get out of hand, he just hits you in the shin. Oh. Remember one time, I walked by him. I didn't say hi. He goes, oh, okay. Bam. Every time from there on out, and my friends would come up like, you better say hi. <laughs> I ain't getting hit for your sorry but You better say hi. And you know what the second thing was? Everything was about pulling weeds. Oh, you got a bad attitude? Come here, me. Come here. You got a bad attitude? Start pulling weeds. Right. Gosh. It's like pulling weeds builds character in you. You're down there just mumbling. Y'all and, 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 know you don't mumble out loud. So I swear they can hear everything, huh? They'd be like, I'm all the way. I hear you mumbling. <laughs> right? I feel like that's what God wants to do to us right now. Oh, you want to cancel people? But see, but nobody wants to be canceled. We need fathers and mothers in the faith that comes to come slap us silly, to come help us process these things. Because I got news for you. You're never going to see eye to eye with every single person, but you got to learn to love each other. That's what's missing. Last but not least, you're going to learn. It says in Acts chapter 2, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. God wants us to learn. I want to leave you with two thoughts, and then we're going to, well, we're going to go to another service. You guys get to go to lunch. Tacos Tijuana, somebody. Just go for me. Tell them I said hi. I'll be there shortly. All right. 
two things we want to close with. Number one is, and this is my shameless plug for small groups again, um, you're going to make new friends. You're going to make new friends. Join a small group. Um, I tell people this all the time. Sometimes you don't have a faith problem. You have a friend problem. And if you would just get new friends who have faith like you have faith, then you'll find yourself not doing what the old you used to love to do. Okay? That's all you got to do. That's all you got to do. Stop having drinking friends and concert friends and partying friends. Get you some first Wednesday friends, some small group friends, some Sunday friends, and you're going to be all right. You need to switch up your friends and you'll watch your faith grow. I didn't say get rid of them. But if they don't want to go with you, you might just have to add some new friends to the fold. You know what I'm saying? So, okay. So I want to give you that. And the last thing, I just, I just, I, I decided I wanted to talk about this. Stand to your feet and I'll, I'll close with this. So it's pretty cool that in Israel, there are festivals. There are festivals. If you're in the overflow, go ahead and stand up. I'm going to pray for you guys here in a second. There are festivals that every Jew has to come home for. Okay, they have to come home for it. So you got like Yom Kippur, uh, David's home. You got Rosh Hashanah, the New Year. You got these places, right? You got these times that people, festivals. And then we're coming up on ones here real quick called the High Holy Days. So all these festivals together, they come in and they celebrate these things. And so you have the outer court, which some of us who've been to Israel, you've seen the Wailing Wall, you've seen the outer court, right? Yeah, you were with me, you saw the outer court. Uh, we couldn't, actually, you were on your side and I was on my side. That's right. That's how it works over there. And so you have the outer wall and it's huge and it looks like it fit a ton of people. And then you walk into the inner part of it, and it's like this is where the sanctuary, this is where the temple would have built, and it's smaller. But here's what's crazy. The, the Jews teach that used, there used to be 10 miracles, 10 miracles about walking into where the sanctuary is, right, to the, to, the, to the temple court. One of the miracles was that anytime they would slaughter an animal, and they would slaughter a lot of animals for their atonement, there would be no flies inside the inner, the inner temple. No flies. Because flies were a plague in Egypt, not a plague for God's people. No flies. All that blood, all that dead animal, and no flies. That's, that's incredible. Uh, they also said that the showbread that was set out for God, there was a, these racks of showbread, they would never grow stale, and they would never get mold, no matter how many days they sat out. Now, how many of you like that for your pen? Dulce? Never go, never get hard and never get mold. Because how many of you know by the next day, that mug is hard? Come on, somebody. That is a rock. That is a doorstop. That is a weapon, if you need it to be. But my grandfather would have it no other way because he'd dip it in his coffee. Where are those old school people at? You know what I mean? Deo Pandulce is the best for them people. Okay, God bless you. All right, okay. There was another miracle, and this is what I want to share with you. This is what I want you to catch. They would see people, because it was a journey from wherever you're coming from in the world. They would have the doors, and they would see people walking from afar. And no matter how many people were in the temple, there was this unique ability given to us by Hashem, by God. That no matter how many people still needed to come in, God would always make room for them. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. It could be packed in like sardines, and all of a sudden they see another person, and they would open the door, and somehow God would open the place up. God wants to make room for people who want to worship him. This is the miracle provision of what God wants to do. And that's why we do what we do. We talk about adding services. Like we got one right after this. And I'm supposed to have shut up a few minutes ago about it. Because we got people who need your parking spot. Like really bad. <laughs> Number two, that's why we open up more campuses. So that we can make room. So this is what I need from you. You need to pray about your place here. Maybe your next step is baptism tonight. Maybe your next step is joining the A-team. Maybe your next step is a small group. But let me tell you what you do have. You do have a next step. But only you can pray about what that is. Amen? Sound good? Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather in your place. Lord, we want to make room for everything you're doing here. And now, Father, come and have your way as we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen.